and welcome in to Press Box Live. I'm Stan the Fan Charles and uh, of Press Box and PressBoxOnline.com, along with my partner, Ross Grimsley, who joins me each and every Monday night. And with us is our old friend, Mike Devereaux, number 12 on the Baltimore Orioles uniform back in the uh, 80s and 90s. And Mike, uh, first of all, to both of you, happy, healthy New Year to both of you. How were your holidays? Wonderful. Oh, they're great. They're great. <laughs> you know, it's always good to, to, to finish up and get back to, you know, back on track with everything. But um, it, it was really fun. Happy New Year and uh, happy holidays to you guys also. Ross, uh, any, uh, any, both of you, to both of you, I've had a mini scare about 10 days ago where I had to get tested, but I proved negative. But uh, a lot more people around us than before have come down with COVID. How about the both of you? You've been able it, to duck it's it? It's crazy. It's crazy. We were in Baltimore for, for Christmas. We got to, uh, you know, Christmas Eve and uh, Christmas Day and stuff. And then we were able to get a couple more days in with my my son's family and my daughter. And we started feeling bad, I think on a Tuesday, and we decided to get back to uh, Florida, feeling terrible. And as of yesterday, we, we are, we're almost 100%. So it was awful. It was, uh, you know, feeling bad. Uh, I think I'm not sure what it was. Getting a test was really tough to do. Uh, and but but we're back to uh, normal. Nine holes of golf in today. Hit some balls too. So ready to get rolling. You got nine holes of golf in today in the snow. Yeah, I, no, I'm not in Baltimore. I'm back here. Oh, that's right. You're in Florida. <laughs> I'm, okay, I'm sorry. I'm here with me and Devo are in Florida. Uh, buddy. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. We, we we don't see we don't see any snow here. No, yeah. not yet. Not even uh, close. And Devo, how about you? Any scares of uh, COVID related? Yeah, well, our oldest son tested positive um, on New Year's Eve, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And um, he has some mild symptoms right now. He's starting to hopefully getting better. Um, the rest of us have no symptoms, but we're all quarantined. Haven't gone anywhere except for like, you know, the, I'll take the kids out and get some exercise around the block. And I'm just curious. And you, all you, that. You, you, I'm just curious, Mike. You're you're vaccinated and and boosted. Yes. Okay, fully good. vaccinated plus the booster. Me My too. whole family is vaccinated, but even Great. the kids. Great. Hey, speaking of your kids, I understand you've got one of your kids is a pretty darn good baseball player. What what is his name? How old is he? And I mean, is this like a a Devereaux in the future that we're going to see? Well, we shall see. You know, it, it, it takes a lot, you know, in this game oh, of baseball, yeah. no doubt. But I'll tell you what, his name is Michael also. And uh, the best thing about it is that he loves this game. And uh, and he loves to be out there. He's very competitive. And, and he is really good. And he's, and he's really fast. He loves other sports also. Um, but uh, he, he'll go to sleep watching uh, highlights of uh, MLB on, on, on YouTube. I mean, every time I go in his room... I tell him, you know, set the set the sleep on the TV, set the sleep on the TV before he goes to bed. And I'll go in there and sure enough, there'll be home run highlights. There'll be all kinds <laughs> of highlights. He's constantly watching the highlights. How, what how position, old is he now? How old is he? Um, he's what 10 position? years old. Um, 10 years old. He'll be 11 in June. He's, he's left-handed, so he's a pitcher. And uh, so he's getting, getting pitching lessons as, uh, actually with uh, 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 Telford, Anthony Telford. And, um, oh, good. and yeah. uh, he plays first base, a real good, has a good glove, and he's learning on his own out there. I mean, he's just trial and error. He's really doing well. And he plays center field. Uh, also, we'll throw him in at shortstop, you know, in some of the tough games, and we don't have anybody else to play over there. And he's, off, you know, he's the best shortstop, but he's still left-handed. So Now, before I turn you over to Ross, it, so being left-handed, I, I understand you're, you're getting them all the experience you can at different positions. But, but is the fact that he's down south, is that a big help to kids as opposed to kids who don't, aren't able to play as much baseball up north, Mike? And you, of I, I course, want, were, I don't say you of course were in Wyoming, you know. Right, right. And that's, and that's why, you know, I don't want to say it's more of an advantage being in Florida playing every day. I, sometimes I might even think it's a disadvantage because, because I want them to play other sports. And, yeah. and, and growing up in Wyoming, I had no other choice. There's nobody playing baseball right now obviously you can go inside and play and there's they have facilities indoor facilities now all over the country which we didn't have when we were young but um uh play football which he already played or i'm gonna get to play basketball 
and it's easier to play other sports where you're in a, a, a city or a state where where there's weather change, where it's cold, too cold to be outside. But here, you know, a lot of these kids and a lot of their parents uh, believe that they, they get behind if they're not playing. It's like, oh, such and such, he's still playing baseball. He's going to get a hit. He's going to get a hit. And I'm like, no, it doesn't work that way. No. You know, you got to play all the sports, you know, get your Ross, we got a frozen Mike Devereaux there. We got a frozen. Minute. Yes, we do. We'll, we'll, we'll hope that he's back momentarily. Yeah. Uh, he, made a, he made a good point, uh, you know, being down here in Florida, playing uh, year round. And you know what? I, I, you would think it would be a benefit, but, you know, playing year round, you see a lot of kids burn out, uh, you know, doing that. And, and I've seen it and uh, I've witnessed it and stuff. And, and getting a chance to play other sports. That is really essential, I think, in the development of athletes. You know, you, you get a chance to, uh, to do some things uh, that you normally wouldn't. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very important, I think. And let me ask you a question. I have no idea if we'll be able to get Mike on. Once we go live like this, we may not be able to get him. But one of the things I listened to in Mike's answer um, is that his kid was playing pitcher, First base, center field, even shortstop, it's even shortstop. though he's left-handed. Now, yeah. does that take a little bit of the burnout away from playing baseball if you're moving around? And also, at 10 years of age, I don't know that you want your kid throwing every single time, you know. No, it depends on how much you play. Because usually, uh, the people that throw the ball the most, obviously, is the pitcher, the yep. catcher and your shortstop. Usually the best player on their team is your shortstop. Yeah. You know, and now if, if you're, if you're pitching and I, I tell you one of the things that, that my father did, thank God, uh, cause he played 16 years in the minor leagues, a little bit with the white Sox in 1951. And, uh, he goes, he went to the coach at my, he's pitching every fourth day. That's it. He's not pitching the uh, two days in a row. He's pitching every fourth day, fourth or fifth day. That's when he pitches. Now, however you want to do it, but that's it. That, that, that's what he's doing. So pitching on, on that type of thing, and obviously I, I had a benefit. I threw the ball over the plate. I think that's one of the biggest things. You know, how can you throw the ball consistently over the plate? Let me just interrupt you for one second. It looks like we got Mike back on, but Mike, your audio and your camera you need to, down at the bottom, you should be able to click yourself on our, our video so we can see you, and it looks like you might be, are you, can you hear us, Mike? No. Nope. Don't think so. Okay. Uh, doesn't look good. Doesn't look good for getting, so go yeah. ahead, Ross. No, I mean, I, you know, like I said, playing several sports, uh, just not overdoing it, throwing, because like I said, your shortstop, your catcher throw the ball, you know, a lot as the pitcher does. But if you uh, if you do it repeatedly every day, you know, especially say you pitch and then you play shortstop the next day, you're going to make a lot of you know important throws. There's going to be a little extra on it, and that possibly you know after pitching, you know, ever how much you pitched could, could be a problem. That's where you see a lot of injuries uh, de develop, which is a big problem, especially in this day and age. All right. Once we've started, in case Mike Devereaux can hear us, let's see if he, and, and even if we can't get his audio up, it looks like he's trying to connect to the audio. Uh, we could at least talk to him. Mike, can you hear us? He, there, there he is. There he is. There's Mike okay. Devereaux. You back with us, Mike? Can you, can you unmute yourself or... Are you there? It looks like you're you're on. Can you hear us? Mike Devereaux, can you hear us? <laughs> I'm trying to see if I can figure out. This is a first for us. Sorry. Right. <laughs> Mike, if you if you can hear us, Mike, if you can turn on your audio somehow, you it does not say you're muted but we're not able to hear you and you aren't able to hear us connecting to audio. Okay. Let's, let's check it out here. Works. Let's see if this works. How about now? Ask to unmute Mike unmute. One more stop. 
There we go. Unmute <laughs> oh, that button. We're closing in on it. Unmute, Unmute down there, at buddy. the bottom. Unmute at the bottom. <laughs> yeah, Red. I'll... All right. Anyway, Mike you know, Devereaux I'll, I'll is a... there. He is. Mike, can you hear us now? Yeah. Mike, we're going to have to redo this sometime in the future. I apologize, Mike. Unmute. Unmute. <laughs> Unmute. Un unfortunately, we're not. Mike, can you hear us? Unmute. <laughs> He's unmuted about three times. Oh, yeah. yeah. Something's, it's, something's a, a malfunction. Yeah. Malfunction in the uh, mute. Mike, we're going to continue without you. Okay. All right. We'll do it again <laughs> some other time. All right. That's Mike Devereaux. Yeah. And if he tries again, we'll try and get him on. Right. But I'll tell you what we, Ross, uh, and that's the first time we've done like uh, about 100 of these or, or 110 of these. Uh, we've ever had a frozen and then an inability to get somebody on. But um, what I wanted to talk to Mike Devereaux about tonight was what we got going on in Major League Baseball right now. Right. And that is the, the lockout of the players. Now, obviously, the only thing that's really affected by that right now is the players' uncertainty over whether they're going to play in the major leagues, uh, whether they're going to go to Korea. And I think we've seen, <laughs> Ross, I think you follow an yeah. awful lot of MLBTradeRumors.com. It really seems like we're having more of those, those 4A players right. actually signing to play in Korea and Japan because of certainty of getting a contract. Sure. Right now. I mean, it, it, one Have of the you things, noticed that? Well, absolutely. One of the things that, that you see, there's a lot of younger players in the major leagues now, probably more than ever before. And they, they have found a way to, uh, I believe, save money and eliminate the older players. As, as coaches, you know, and stuff that they save money. This is one of the things they do. And, and the problem with that is the integrity of the game. Obviously, you're not putting the, the best quality uh, players on the field. That's the problem you have with tanking, which is that's a part of the integrity of the game. Max Scherzer made that comment. Uh, I, I just hope that the young players understand it. Uh, I, I think the minimum salary is a big thing. It's the lowest of any major uh, uh, or team sport, you know, major sport, football, basketball, you know, so on than any other one. So now you got to get the players, uh, the, the first year guys, the minimum salary guys uh, up to where they should be. I mean, yeah. it, it's, but now the guys are saying we can go here, we can go there and make more money. The older four, a guys, who are the guys that really were uh, called upon when a, when a major league guy got hurt, those guys could come up and spell them for a week or so until they got ready again. Now these guys aren't wanted, you know, which is mind boggling. But, but again, if you're really, uh, you really want to win, you're going to bring these guys up, but now you're not nah, the heck with it. We'll just bring Joe blow up, you know, as a pitcher who throws 97 miles an hour up to a hundred at times. And if he blows out, we'll just get another guy. Right. So exactly. that, that's one of the things you see. And it's really, uh, it, it's really mind boggling what has happened, but I've talked to some people recently that uh you know it all comes down to how can we save a buck how right. can we save a nickel or a dime here and and not worry about the integrity of the game which, which is really awful so one of the things i've noticed having nothing to do with the this lockout right now but it was over the last five years and i guess it started with the first guy i really remember but maybe 10 years ago was colby lewis whose career got stalled at the major league level and he went over to Japan and he got a couple years in there where he really reestablished himself as a star in Japan. And now we're seeing it play out like that with a multitude of players of four American players and yeah. Japanese players and Korean players are coming over. What is it about the level of play? I know you never played over there in a professional league, but is the ball in Korea and Japan 
is it above the AAA level? In other words, so, yeah, you so know, there's it, some more development that takes place? Yeah, it, it depends. I think it really depends on, on who's on the field. It's like an independent ball. Independent ball has really gotten big uh, as of the last several years. And it was, you know, you could see it start to move in that direction. But I, I think uh, Korea, uh, Japan, I mean, yeah, they have some guys that can do some things. And the better players are your stars can possibly, uh, you know, come over here and, and do a, especially now, yeah. you know, when the, I, I, the players are bigger, faster, stronger. Now, do they play the game as well as they could play it? No, because you got, you got people, which is again, mind boggling to me. You got you spend all this money for these draft players that you draft and you're having a guy from uh, some facility or some junior college teach them how to play. That, that just don't work. I mean, I, you can say it, it's like having a, uh, uh, a guitar player try to teach a, a drummer how to drum, you know, in, in music. Well, we all we played music, but it's not the same. It's not, I mean, it just it make, makes no sense. I mean, and you get into certain situations that, that people have never been in that are trying to teach you about whatever that, that profession is, it, it, who do you want teaching? If somebody's been there that's done it, that to me is the most amazing thing. And, and it's all about saving money. Don't, don't let anybody kid you. It's all about saving money and they'll just do whatever they can, but you see it on the field. Now you can see it. I mean, it, yeah, there's, not a team, there's not a team of the 30 major league baseball teams right now that doesn't have two or three guys from some academy sure. that are, are doing it rather than former players. Stan, and, you, you might have, you might have 13, 14 coaches. Yeah. Oh, you got almost a, pretty soon. They're going to have more coaches than players, <laughs> you know, and it, it's, and well, the scared. NFL, the NFL teams have gotten really crazy. Oh, geez. I mean, it, it used to be it, like a head coach. And six or eight guys. Now it's 17, 19 guys. You know, you got an assistant crazy. coach for the assistant coach, you know, hey, which we're, is, we're talking today. It's our first Zoom of the 2022 season. Uh, Mike Devereaux was our guest. We ran into technical problems first time ever. Not that we've had technical problems, but that we couldn't reestablish Mike uh, again on camera. So Ross and I are talking a little bit about the lockout and the implications of this. Ross, in your career, I noted that there was a 72 strike, and that took place in spring training, didn't it? Correct, yes. Um, could you talk a little bit? In other words, we're still January 3rd. There seems like, oh, there's all the time in the world. Yeah. But we really <laughs> know that their deadline in their mind is, hey, if we can get this thing settled by March 15th, We'll, we'll have a short spring training. That's the way they think. So their deadline isn't, let's get this settled by February 1st. I think most of us would be incredibly surprised if spring training is not is not impacted by this current lockout and that the, the schedule, the regular season schedule isn't impacted. So what my question really to Mike Devereaux was going to be, and I can ask you a little bit, is if if spring training is impacted, how much time do pitchers, catchers, and the position players really need to be ready when the gun goes off, or would we need Ross a twenty-eight or twenty-nine man roster uh, the first month of the season to allow sort of pitchers to ramp up and so on and so forth? Well, you know, with the with the pitchers in this day and age, it, it's a power game for them. How hard can I throw? How how hard can I snap a ball off? We're going to try, excuse me for one second. Yeah. We're going to try Mike one more time because he's trying to get back in. We'll see if this works or not, okay? We we appreciate your forbearance as uh, patrons of watching these Zooms, but we've got Mike Devereaux, and we're going to see if this works now. If you can unmute yourself, Mike, <laughs> hold on. Where's my uh? <laughs> all right, here you go. All right, all right. Here we go. Hey, all right. I'm so sorry. I'm so <laughs> bad at this computer right now. That's all right. 
Go on, you throw it against the wall. Almost one did. But I said, let me do this. I said, let me do this first. <laughs> we, we all been there, buddy. We've we been there. We appreciate your forbearance. So I had just asked Ross the question. We were moving into talking about the lot the the lockout right now on January 3rd. There doesn't seem like there's all that much urgency because, oh, we got all the time in the world. We really, we can settle this, this whole thing by March 15th, and then we'll have a shorter spring training and we'll push back the season a week or something like that. So my question is, Mike, going back through your history of 90 and 94 and 95, is how long do the players need to get ready for the season? Uh, before the season, the quality of play is impacted. Well, I mean, the, the players are in a routine. So they, they, they like, you know, the game baseball, they like doing the same thing year after year. And when, when you start, you know, cutting weeks off uh, in the spring training, you know, a lot of people think they can just jump in and do it, but your body has to get accustomed to doing what it needs to do. I know when we were in that strike, you know, we want we wanted to get there and, and play. We we all wanted to play the game of baseball. And, you know, sometimes, you know, it's like, oh, we have up to here to negotiate. And I, I don't want to say anything bad badly about the owners, but but they don't understand quite what it takes to to get in, in playing mode. And nor do they nor do they really care about it. Right. They, right. they don't that's really true. care about that. That's, you know? that's true. And so we, we want to play. We want our bodies to be ready to play. So you don't want to get in a situation where you have to go out there too soon. It's like going out there without warming up. You know, your reactions aren't going to be the same, things like that. You have to get in the mood to play the game. So normally, and before I turn Ross over to ask you a couple of questions, so normally pitchers and catchers always report like February 8th to 12th, and then the, the, pitch, or the position players report the 18th or 19th. And then they're playing games by March the 1st now. How much time do you really think that players, the position players need? Is it 10 or 12 days of, of the repetition of batting and playing in games to be ready to get into playing games? Well, you know, a lot of these guys are working out throughout the offseason, first of all. Everybody, you, you, you never take any days off. But, but again, that's not, that's not the same as, as game shape. So, so to be able to, to, to be there and, and, and be in game situations like going through spring training games, you know, it, it, it's, it's going to take some time. And it's hard for me to say everybody's different when it comes to that. It's hard to say, you know, a week of games or two weeks of games or whatever is what it, was, is what it takes. But you have to get your legs ready to play because once, once you get on the field, when you, when you play spring training, your adrenaline flows so much. But then once you get into the, the, the regular season, it's a whole different type of adrenaline that's flowing. And that and and that's what you're really getting ready to do, Ross. You know, Mike. You know, and you mentioned that. I know. No matter what we did, and and possibly yourself also, what you did before spring training to not hurt or be sore, you were going to hurt and be sore in spring training no because what? there was just a little bit more effort put into what you were doing, so you wouldn't embarrass yourself. Basically, exactly. what it comes down to. And now the games start, and I, I think the older guys have a better idea of what's going on yeah. and what to do and how to go about it. And one of the things we were talking about earlier before you uh, got back on was with, with the pitchers. Uh, back when I, you know, my, I played it's the strike in 72, 73, and 80, and 81, uh, you know, it's a little bit different. Now the guys are – it's more of a power game for pitchers more of a how hard can I throw the breaking ball? I mean, those guys have to really make sure they're in really top-notch shape, uh, game game shape. As before, it was more of a control type thing. We'd let one go every now and then. But now, I mean, it's really – and the way guys go down now, uh, when they're in shape, that, that that's a, a scary thing. So, obviously, that is something that the players have to take into consideration. And a lot of them are young and don't know. Exactly. You know, they, they sure they sure don't. And you're absolutely right, Grims. You know, these guys are throwing that hard ball. They're throwing fastballs, fastballs, fastballs. And that arm has to be ready to 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 to, to, to take that. And and it's a, and, and you're right. It's a whole different game when you're playing. No matter how much you work out during the offseason by yourself, with a couple of few other guys. No matter how much you work out, you might think you're ready, 
And then that day one, day two, <laughs> yeah. you are sore. You are right. sore. And you're hurting. It's like, man, I've been working out all winter. No. <laughs> well, you have, but it's not the same. And that's no. what happens when you take these weeks off or whatever and say, okay, I can go back and play, you know, at the big league level uh, or starting these games early when you start, you know, the season. You have to be ready for that. So if, if in fact, they, they were to, in the worst case scenario, they settle March 10th to 15th. And then do you think they do need to push the season back eight or 10 days too to give it a full 23, 24 days before players are really ready and not risking injury that can complicate their season? It depends on how worried they are about injuries. I mean, the, we, we had our season pushed back and sometimes they like saying, well, let's, let's just get it going. Let's just get it going. Um, I think it's better to, 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 I mean, if you, if you have the opportunity, obviously, you know, in the cold states, the cold cities, it's, it's, it's fine, but then you get to the, the, the latter part of the season, then it starts getting cold again. But I mean, a week or two is not to me, not that big a difference as far as pushing the games back. But it just depends on what the owners want. I mean, if they want these players to be healthy and go out there strong, you know, play the top of their game, which is what the players want to do. Ross? Yeah, no, it, it's uh, – that's pretty scary. But knowing that uh, uh, that your, your spring training is shortened, what happens is your borderline players aren't going to get the opportunities. It's going to be – these are the guys that we think are going to be here. They are the ones that are going to get the innings – the at bats because it's kind of a hurry up, hurry up thing. You'll take your rest when you get it or when you can have it, but it's you you got your main guys getting ready for the season then. Right. Yeah. You know, what well, which is crazy, but uh, that's yep. the way it is. But I don't think, and, and you mentioned it before, I don't think the owners really understand. And not a lot of talk has been discussed about the injuries right, during the season during that, that's something that's just put on the back burner, which I think is crazy because of the injuries that are happening uh, during the season, you know, before the season, off the field, some of the things. But one of the things that, uh, Devo, that, uh, you know, with the, the strike as a player, you know, as a player, I know I, I went through 72, 73. You went through uh, the 90s with some things. What are some of the things that you did as a, uh, as a player to stay ready? Because you never knew when this thing was going to end. That's or whatever, question. but what, what, what did you do what, uh, yeah. to stay ready, or as ready as you could be? Yes. Yeah, also, you want to try to stay on the down low because the owners would use that against you. If you <laughs> if, if they saw you working out and ready to play, they're like, they, they, they'd say, oh, we guys, these guys are ready, so we don't need that yeah. much time. So, but yeah, I mean, I just try my best to, to, to keep throwing and, and, and keep running and, and do as much as I could, knowing that it's not going to be enough because it's, not, it's never going to be enough, but, it, but, it's, it, but it's something. I, you have to do something. You don't want to go in there just just out of nowhere, which I guess back way back before all of us, I mean, you'd have time off and you go to spring training really to get in shape. Yeah. And and nowadays, you know, you better be ready as soon as you get there. And uh, and and you know, when, when there's a strike and a lockout, that was the hardest part about it. It was for us to make sure that we we're ready, especially when we knew that they were gonna shut, you know, weeks down or something like that. We had to make sure that, hey, you know, that now now you're in a situation to be more vulnerable to get hurt and and you not have only, to not only physically mentally and oh, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not pulling out the violin for players but the uncertainty mike were you ever uncertain who you were going to play with during a labor situation uh in other words there's gads of players out there now that don't know who they're going to play with there's going to be this glut of free agency uh, in March at some point in time when this all comes. How about that, the toll that the uncertainty on families and all the, of that? And that's exactly what I fell into. Um, I was a free agent in 94. So going into that strike in 94, I wasn't on a team. So what had happened is that uh, Major League Bay or the Players Association got a, a facility together in, um, in, where was it, in Florida, in South Florida. Was it uh, What's the name of that facility? Uh, was it Hillsboro? No. Was it the old no, Cleveland it was Indians? South... Was it the old Cleveland Indians facility? I'm trying to think of the name of it. I know a hurricane came through there one time years That's after. that's the place I'm thinking of. That's, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so we're Winter so, Haven? Winter Haven? Was that? Winter Haven? 
No, 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 no. Further okay. south. Okay. Homestead. I think it was Homestead. Homestead. Go ahead, though. All right. Um, so anyway, um, so all the free agents went down there for spring training. We did our little own little spring training down there and, you know, negotiating contracts and people would leave one at a time, you know, and I, I was scared to death. I really was. And so I, I was like, you know, I, I'd hate to be the last guy in, in that spring training camp, but I actually, believe it or not, I was the first guy to leave. And that's when I signed with, uh, with uh, the White Sox, and there wasn't much ne much negotiations, and I was like, yeah. like, I'm like, yep, I'm gone here. Let's go. Okay. I, I just took what they offered, and, and yeah, I mean, I management has the upper hand then when it when Absolutely. it's a shortened window like that. Absolutely, okay. because they're like saying, well, if you don't sign, I'll go get this other guy that you're working out with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I didn't give them that opportunity. I was like, let me go ahead and play this season out and, and, and deal with uh, everything else after this. That's is this is this is the potential for shortened training camp and everything much easier on position players than it is on pitchers because the that's pitchers to need to ramp up I'm, more. That's hard for me to answer because I'm not a, a pitcher. Yeah. Um, I I know what I have to get go, go through in, in order to be ready when it comes to you know my leg rate. I you know I have to be ready to hit to to hit a triple. I mean that that that's the main thing. If I triple's the hardest thing to hit, and your legs from going from second to third, you know you might pull muscle, and that's that's it. Or or get that extra that extra uh, uh, dump after uh, after a ball like a line drive in the gap. You know that extra little uh, that 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 spur of the moment movement you have to make. Those are little things that that people really don't see and don't think about. Yeah. As far as being ready or being not ready or not quite ready. Yeah. You know, as a pitcher. I know in spring training back in the seventies and eighties, when I was there, we, you know, you, you built up as you went along and you were able to go through the dead arm period in spring training. Yeah. You don't have that luxury now. You know, the guys go through the dead arm period during the season at the beginning of the season, you know, but it's, it's a slow, I mean, they don't get a lot of innings at the beginning, you know, during spring training for pitchers. Right. So that, that, that's kind of tough. And the starters, they, what, they want five, six innings at the most out of them now. And that's a lot, you know, and so they're, they're not trained to do that, right. you know, at the, so, at the spring training level. So obviously you're going to struggle some, you know, and, and so like what, I said, go ahead, Stan. What you're saying, Ross, is when the season starts, if it's a truncated shortened spring training, Pitchers can get into that dead arm period in mid-April, early May. They do. They really get in during the it. season. Yeah. You know, and because the guys don't – they, for me and, and all the people I've talked to and what I've seen and what I've heard from the people in the game now, the, the, the pitchers are really coddled to the point where we're, if you, we're not going to do too much or you'll get hurt, you know, and that's totally wrong. You know, I mean, it, it's – you just you just have to watch them and and you know and you, the people that are doing it don't they don't know how would they yeah. know you know which, which is sad but it, it's uh it's something that that's the way it is now you know so now you got to find a way to get a guy his innings and get ready especially and if it's a hurry hurried up thing now you're really got a problem yeah and and, and that's the thing Grims and Stan it's funny that you say that because I remember in spring training and this has nothing to do with strikes or anything like that but but when we practice rundowns you know or uh, uh pfps things like that you know we as the outfielders were the ones that were always doing the running we always had the helmets right. on right. we're doing the running and so us as coming up in the game playing all through my career the outfielders we're trying our best to figure out our best way to get out of a rundown okay like I do, okay, I faked my pick off, yes, but now how do I get out of it? And that's me working on me, you yeah. know, getting out of rundowns and getting out and making those guys look stupid. And I'm not just, not <laughs> the pitchers, but the position players also. Yeah, because sure. they're yep. throwing the balls. Yep. And uh, as outfielders, we're talking about it. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. Watch this. Watch me do this. Watch me do this. Nowadays, they'll say, hit runners, we want you at 60%, 50%. We don't want you. We want these guys just to make two throws and that's it. And they go through this little easy, simple routine. And yeah, of course you can get somebody going half speed. 
Right. All right, great right. job, guys. Take it to the house. Demo, it, <laughs> it may be it may be outfielders from Double A that they brought up to do that. Yes. I've seen. I know that how that works. You know, exactly. they, they bring the guys up to shag. They bring the they bring the guys up to shag and use them as runners for rundowns, uh, uh, cutoffs and relays if they even do that anymore. But they use those guys. They don't even use the players. You know, you're using guys. So it's just it's just like shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm always on. amazed. I'm always amazed, and I I never played baseball at a particularly high level but it's pretty easy to understand on a rundown that the thing you want to do is the most important thing is to run right at the runner to shorten his distance between where you want him to go. And where, but so many times you see a, a guy back at second base, he'll make a long throw to the third baseman or a long throw to home plate that that allows the runner to get, it's just really crazy sometimes. Uh, what's crazy Stan is they let the runner that they have in a rundown, they let the runner that, that hit the ball, if it was hit, right. go to Always the extra advantage. base. Yeah, no I mean, come on. That. I mean, it, it, but that's that all comes down. They work on it, but they don't work on it a lot. They Is work that on not it right, Devo? Feet. They barely they work on it to get it out of the way. Okay. Exactly yeah. right. And in PFP now, the guys don't even throw the ball to the catcher and they don't very rarely throw it to the bases with right. any. And I'll tell you a story. They had a guy that came over from, I forget where it was, the Red Sox, when I was with the Giants. And he was going through PFP half, half speed. The coach dropped the bat and walked off. So they go, what are you doing? I said that they called two of the top guys over. They called Bumgarner, Matt Kane, and another guy. And he says, listen, this guy's coming from another organization to an organization that just won two World Series in the last three years. This guy's doing this half ass. So if I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do this. So if, if I was you, this is your team. Right. This is your team. I would tell this guy, we don't do that crap here. We right. don't go, we don't go through that half ass. We we do it full bore. We do it the way it's supposed to be done. But if you guys are okay with that, the I'll go tell both you that you know you guys didn't want to do this. Yeah. You know correctly. And you know what? They took care of it, said, we'll do it. And that's all you got to do. And it, it just takes, you know, you got to have some pride. You got to do it the yeah. way you're supposed to do it. And yeah, that, that's, that's right. very simple, I think. Yep. But it is funny, as Mike talked about his personal work to get to make them look stupid. I'm running back through my head, Mike. I remember you used to, if you got caught in a rundown, you ended up making the other team throw like eight or nine throws easily. You were you were a, not an easy guy to, to actually put the, the tag on. I, I, I'm not going to give up. And that's the thing. Some guys I get run up. I'm out here. I'm like, For what? For what? And see, so you, you, you work on that in spring training. You really do. If you're allowed to do it 100%. Yeah. See, nowadays yeah. they're like telling the outfielders up, oh, hey, hey, don't make them do too much. And if an outfielder right. does, like a young you're helping yourself and you're helping the pitchers and the exactly. infielders. Everybody's, everybody's working. Everybody's, everybody's benefiting working. from it. You yeah, know, and, right. and that's the way it should be. Yeah. Hey, let's take a couple of minutes. So, Mike, yeah. what is your I, I know you probably don't wake up every day and read about it or what. What is your basic understanding of what it what this is about right now? you have a, a thought or two on that? I, I really don't. I, I, you know, I assume it's something similar to where there has been in the past where, where the owners just want more control of, of, of protecting themselves or, 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 or yeah. you know, legislating themselves so they don't get themselves in trouble with, with spending too much money. <laughs> so, so in order yeah. to do that, they have to, they have to break the union. And, and the, only way, the only way they can break the union is to lock them out. Lock us out. Nobody plays. Now you have, you know, fans thinking it's about the money and the players should just think about playing the game, you know, let the owners do what they want to do. And the players are like, you know, there's people that fought for us way down in history. Yep. And we are not going to let those people that fought for us down. Plus, we're fighting for our kids and the next generation of players. And that's exactly the way we right. look at it. That's, that's the way right. we look at it. Absolutely. So, and, and it's hard. No, it's hard for the fans to quite understand that. And, and, yeah. and we, we understand that too. So we can't well, let seemed, that cloud what our, our main goal is. 
it seems uh, it, like that's what, that's it, one of the reasons that the, the 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 media, you know, obviously sides with the ownership. Yeah. But and when you break all of this down, you got revenue sharing. You got uh, local and national television. You got uh, the public funding for the stadiums, the naming of the stadiums. You got now gambling revenues that's Oof. coming into play. You don't have stream, gambling at the stadiums. Yeah. Oh yeah. And that's not even that's not even mentioning parking concessions and uh, uh, tickets, which is almost forty percent of the revenue. That's not even included in this other stuff. So there's a lot of money here. And as I told, we were Stan, we're talking earlier. The minimum salary is not even up to what football, basketball, and any other major sports are. You know. And now you've got so many young players in it. You've got. Uh, uh, what roster manipulation, you got tanking, you got all of these things, come on, you yeah. know, that needs to be addressed. And you know what? It's not going to get settled if the owners aren't going to negotiate. Right. In good exactly. faith. Well, it, it won't it, get settled. It almost seems like what they do is they've always squeezed players at the beginning of their careers by limiting when they can become free agents and having right. control over them. But what's happened over the last 10, 12 years to me what I see is now you get to be 31 or 32. They're squeezing you then because the analytics say, don't give a guy 30 years old or 31, a five or six year contract, try to get them on one and two year deals. So they squeeze everybody at the beginning and the end. And I think that's, what's really become unfair to the players. Sure. And I agree with you, Ross. I think that the the minimum salary should go up by three or four hundred thousand dollars because the player that's getting making the minimum is the guy who has most recently gone through the struggles to get to get to the major leagues. Yeah. But then at the, yeah. the end of the career, that's a that's a confusing can of wax as to how to settle that thing. Well, those those players are very important. You know, There's no question ones, about it. That way, they, they mean so much to the team, and, and that's what you got. So many young players in the game now who are being taught by people that have rarely played at any high level. For the, you know, a lot of them. So these guys are very important uh, for many reasons. You know, to to teach them and to help them. You know, and, and it's and eliminating them is not helping the game. The integrity of the game is really at stake here. I, I think, and, it, and a lot of, I hope the older player, I hope the younger players listen to these older guys because I mean, th there's a lot at stake here. Yeah. Hey, Mike, we really, we really appreciate your time. We usually keep these to about 30 minutes with our technical problems and starting yeah. a couple of minutes late. We're about 45 minutes in. I just wanted to ask both of you before we leave. Uh, somebody that we got to watch pretty closely manage the Baltimore Orioles for 10 years, Buck Showalter, uh, got back in the show. There aren't a lot of guys. Uh, Davey Johnson was one that managed four or five, five teams. Uh, <coughs> Dusty Baker managed five teams. But Buck Showalter now moves into that. What do you think? I'll start with Mike and then I'll end with Ross. What do you think he does to a team like the Mets immediately, Mike? Well, I mean, great manager, have you have you look at it, and, and yeah. it's great to have him back in the game. Uh, you know, a manager like that, and you know, he's the type of manager to me. I mean, I, I've never I've never played under him, but the type of person he seems to me is like a, he's a player's manager. You know, he respects the game, he respects his players, and has a way of of of, of motivating his players, which is the type of manager that you need. We'll see. I mean, you know, no telling what happens with the Mets. There's no telling, but I, I think he's somebody that is, that is really good for the game. And I'm, I'm happy to see that, that, that he's back in it. Ross, uh, yeah. we don't know the health of Jacob deGrom, but we can pretty much assume with the way things work out that the beginning of the season, Buck Showalter may have walked into the best position he's ever been in by having <laughs> Jacob deGrom and Max Scherzer, arguably two of the top three or four pitchers in the game. Uh, what do you think he brings to the Mets? Well, you know what? And, and you saw what he did with the Orioles at the beginning. He he had full control of everything. You know, he he everything at the minor leagues. He was he was he was at the stadium in Bowie a lot of times. Yeah. You know, in, in uniform. So he is hands on. He's going to have a. Uh, uh, 
you know, something to say about everything. He's going to be, you know, he wants to know about scouting. He wants to know about whatever's going on. He wants to know about it and he's going to have his hands in most of it because he's been successful doing it, you know? <clears throat> so I, I really think this is a great move. Uh, he's used to the New York climate, that's uh, the you big, know, that's the, the media for me. Yeah. And you know what? They'll love him because he knows how to handle them and knows what to say. That he'll, is have so, a, he'll have a meat out of his Oh, hands. God, yes. It'll be great. But I, I think this is a great thing for the Mets and uh, for Buck. And it's great to get him back in the game. And hopefully there'll be some uh, other guys that are out of the game that will be able to follow in his footsteps and do some things around baseball, you know, which is really a, would be a good thing for it, would really help it out. But I think this is a great move. And I think Buck is a, a ideal person for this job in New York. All right, one last, one last thing, prediction. Mike, when do you think we'll see opening day this year? Oh, my it's goodness. Scheduled, <laughs> it's scheduled for like March 29th or 30th, I think. When do you think we'll see it? Uh, I'm going to go with the 15th of April. Tax, tax man. Ross, <laughs> what about you? There it is. Stan, uh, Stan Devo, you know what? I, I, I don't – it, if, it, if it lasts – uh, longer than when opening day is supposed to start. I don't think that does any good for anybody. I mean, uh, you, you, you don't have uh, uh, Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire, Bobby uh, Barry Bonds going for the home run record. You don't have uh, Ripken going for that, uh, you know, consecutive games, Lou Gehrig's record. You don't have that now. And you're coming, you know, and out, what, and you're coming out of two straight seasons affected by this pandemic. Oh, absolutely. And you don't know if, if the third season will be affected well, and by it. Attendance is, is down the lowest it's been since 83. Yeah. The average attendance is the lowest it's been since uh, the 70s. So the, the, the fans, this doesn't put a good taste in their mouth. No, not uh, at you know, all. And, and you're, you got to do something uh, to get these people back in, involved in the game somehow and, and enjoying it, making the games quicker. So what's your, what's your prediction? When do you think we'll see opening I, I, day? I, I, I'm, I'm usually negative, but I, I really think that somebody will will wake up and it's done before opening day. I, I really hope that, and I really, uh, I'm going to be a, a, a positive person, which I'm, I'm normally I'm, not. But I'm not normally positive about this, but I think there's so much money at stake here. Yes, that somehow cooler heads will prevail, and my prediction is it's going to be somebody else that is pushing this, not Manfred, not Tony Clark. It's going to be yeah. somebody else that brings them together, whether it's a federal mediator or something, uh, because there's too much commonality of interest, and uh, they should be able to cross this. You but we'll see. I, I, hey, Mike, I, we really appreciate your time tonight, especially your persistence getting back on. Love Ooh, you, sorry. Man. I apologize for that too, guys. That's but okay. I, I, your I, fault. I'm with you guys on that. I hope, I hope, I hope we start on time. Opening day is the best day there is to get baseball started again. And there's just too much to lose from all this. All right. Really? But thank you guys. Yeah. Happy New Year to you. Happy Absolutely, New Year buddy. Happy New Year to you. Let thank me know you. when you're ready to roll. All right. All right. I'll, <laughs> I'm gonna get tested tomorrow. Yeah. Hopefully, I'm good. Tell, me, tell me Michelle how I I'll from, do that. from Bird me. The same. All right. I will, buddy. All right, Stan. Ross Grimsley and our guest Mike Devereaux. I'm Stan the fan. I'll be back on Wednesday evening at 8 o'clock with former Maryland Terrapin running back now radio analyst Steve Suter, and we'll talk about the prospects for the University of Maryland football program after their convincing win in the Pinstripe Bowl. Good night, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Take care.